Greetings, everyone. Uh, I am Adam Winkler, and I would like to welcome you to the 2015 Alan C. LeBeau uh, Annual Supreme Court Review here at UCLA Law School, known um, by its title, Wither the Court. Um, to begin, I have the pleasure of introducing to you the new dean of the UCLA School of Law, Jennifer Manukin. Dean Manukin has long been one of the leading evidence scholars in the nation, uh, and she has been teaching at UCLA since 2005. We have, I guess, decided to celebrate her decade of dedicated service to the law school community by putting her in charge of the whole thing. And uh, without much uh, more to be said, let me just welcome our uh, brand new dean, and we're all so happy to, to have her, Jennifer Manukin. Thanks so much, Adam, for that uh, generous introduction. I'm the middle introducer. You're going to actually have three introductions here. And so just like Goldilocks, I'll try to make mine you know, not too long, not too short. Actually, I'll try to make it very short um, so that we can get on to the main event. Um, I'm Jennifer Manukin. I am the new dean here at UCLA School of Law. And it's a great pleasure to be uh, introducing um, well, this event, I suppose, um, which is really one of my favorites here at UCLA. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the 2015 Alan C. Lebo Supreme Court Review, our annual Wither the Court program on the Supreme Court's most recent term and its implications for lawyers, for academics, and for citizens. Now, first, I just want to say a few uh, thank yous to some of the organizers of tonight's event. Uh, from our Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Law and Public Policy, I especially want to thank Adeline Lowe, Lauren Zhao, Hamid Jahangard, and Babak Kapanpour, all of whom helped make tonight possible. I also want to thank Brad Sears from the Williams Institute, as well as Kathy Mayorkas from our Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy for helping to create and sustain this program. Now, this program began in 2003, and it's evolved into a school-wide tradition for launching the academic year. And what this event does is take stock of the Supreme Court's term that concluded over the summer. It includes this year blockbuster decisions on same-sex marriage, anti-discrimination law, health care, and the First Amendment. Now, every year the Supreme Court term includes some blockbuster decisions. But I think this year, the blockbusters were really, really blockbusters. And so this is going to be an especially interesting and exciting evening to talk about. The discussions that you're going to hear tonight are the kinds of inquiries that we'll continue to engage in throughout the year here at UCLA, in our classrooms, but also in our extracurricular programming, and also through the kind of faculty scholarship that my colleagues sitting to my right all engage in. And what UCLA offers is not only the academic discussion of these questions, but innovative, considered, and research-based answers to these questions, and sometimes even disagreements about them, and answers and conversations that shape not only the UCLA law community and what it is to get an education here, but also shape public policy uh, debates across the country. Now, before I turn it over, I have just a couple of other things to say. First of all, there will be a reception afterwards, immediately after this panel discussion, on the patio just outside of this room. And I hope you'll all stay uh, for that reception as well. And finally, last but certainly not least, I'm delighted to introduce the third introducer of this evening, one of our alumni and a lecturer here at the UCLA Law School, Cindy Lebo. Through a special fund in honor of her late husband, Cindy has supported the Wither the Court program for several years. And I want to introduce her now and, just, and also to thank her in particular for her generosity and her engagement with this event, which allows us to continue and build on this truly excellent tradition. So Cindy, without further ado, please join us. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Cindy Lebo. I'm a graduate of the class of 1973, uh, and I'm a lecturer in law and political science uh, here at UCLA. Uh, welcome to Wither the Court. It's the law school's annual Supreme Court review program. 
This is the evening that I know many people look forward to every year. I see many familiar faces uh, where we will learn the substance and import of the court's most significant decisions from the past term and possibly look ahead to the controversies and cases that will capture our attention on the first Monday in October, which is just really a few weeks from now. Uh, as many of you know, two years ago, this showcase program was dedicated to the memory of one of the law school's most outstanding graduates, uh, to my late husband, Alan Lebo, a member of the class of 1972, who died in the terrible PSA plane crash in San Diego so many years ago. Uh, to many people, I see a lot of friends here. Uh, to many people in this room, he was an unforgettable friend and confidant, exemplifying in his all too brief career the very best of what a lawyer, and most especially a UCLA lawyer, uh, should be. The dedication of the law school's annual Supreme Court review in his name is a fitting tribute to his memory and his commitment to the public interest. I am so proud that he is honored and remembered by this event. Um, tonight, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing my colleagues. Uh, all members of our nationally acclaimed law school faculty who will be making presentations on the key cases of the 2014-2015 Supreme Court term. And my introductions are going to be in the order of each person speaking and we're gonna do it all at one time so we eliminate the up and down and to and fro. Uh, first of all, let me formally introduce Professor Adam Winkler. Uh, Adam received his JD from New York University Law School, and most importantly, for those of us in the political science department, because we adulate him over there, uh, he received his master's in political science uh, from over here at Bunch Hall in UCLA's political science department. He is a specialist in American constitutional law, and his writing and tweets are often cited by the New York Times, the Washington Post, SCOTUS blog, the Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. Uh, and his truly excellent book, uh, Gunfight, the Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms, has made Adam one of the most important authorities in the country on Second Amendment issues. Next we have Professor Douglas Najame, one of the newest members of the UCLA Law Faculty but someone who is known to many in this audience uh, because last year, Doug spoke at this event when he tried to read the tea leaves about what the Supreme Court was going to do uh, with respect to the same-sex marriage cases. Then he was a professor of law at UC Irvine and a visiting scholar with the Williams Institute, but now he has become a professor of law at UCLA and the faculty director of the Williams Institute. He's a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Law School. He teaches in and is a renowned expert in the areas of family law, law and sexuality, constitutional law, and legal ethics. Uh, welcome, Doug. We are so pleased and uh, honored to have you join the UCLA faculty. And we look forward to hearing your remarks on Obergefell, the hardest Supreme Court case ever to pronounce. Uh, Obergefell versus Hodges and all that has ensued since. Uh, our next speaker is Cheryl Harris, uh, who will be speaking about this term's discrimination and civil rights cases. Cheryl is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the Law School, where she teaches constitutional law, critical race theory, employment discrimination, and race conscious remedies. A graduate of Wellesley College and Northwestern School of Law, Cheryl has produced truly groundbreaking research in the field of critical race theory on subjects such as how race frames our understanding and interpretation of events like Hurricane Katrina. For just a moment, I want to give a plug, something to get in your calendars, uh, to one of the most amazing programs that I have ever seen that the law school is about to put on and that Cheryl has been very instrumental uh, in leading. Uh, on October 16th and 17th, the eighth annual Critical Race Studies Symposium entitled Race and Resistance Against Police Violence, could there be a more timely subject, 
will feature a collection of national experts and policymakers to discuss this pressing subject and the group of people that she has gathered and her team have gathered is truly extraordinary. Uh, so mark it in your calendar, Cheryl, you and your team are to be congratulated for what I know is going to be a phenomenal event. Finally, to talk about the interesting and potentially far-reaching First Amendment cases decided by the court this term is Professor Eugene Volokh. After graduating from UCLA Law School, Eugene held two distinguished judicial clerkships, first for Judge Alex Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and then for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, Professor Volokh teaches free speech, tort law, church-state relations, and a First Amendment amicus brief clinic where he strikes terror into the hearts of some of UCLA's most talented students. Uh, he is well known as the founder, co-author, and frequent contributor of the Volokh Conspiracy, I recommend it to all of you, which is one of the most widely read and I might say influential legal blogs in the nation. So we're going to start, we're going to reserve about 15 minutes at the end of our program for questions from the audience. I'm sure there will be many. There's a microphone that we'll turn on uh, in the middle of the, of the aisle there. Um, so without further ado, Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy, and uh, thanks, of course, to my uh, esteemed panelists uh, and the dean uh, for arranging for uh, a terrific event tonight. So the Supreme Court's 2000, October 2014 term will surely go down as a historic term in the, at the nation's highest court. In a decision sure to be studied for generations to come, the Supreme Court held that the Constitution guarantees the right of same-sex couples uh, to marry in Obergefell versus Hodges. In other major rulings, the Supreme Court, also known to uh, insiders uh, as SCOTUS, uh, upheld key provisions of the Affordable Care Act, uh, affirmed that disparate impact discrimination can suffice to prove violations of the Fair Housing Act, um, upheld a restriction on campaign finance, uh, uh, possibly for the first time in the history of the Roberts Court, and identified potentially strong new protections for the freedom of speech. Many of these decisions tilted in a liberal direction, leading many commentators after the close of the Supreme Court's term to wonder if the Roberts Court, which has been relatively conservative in its first decade, has shifted decisively uh, in the liberal direction. Yet one should not read too much into the results of a single term. Recall that last year at Wither the Court, when we were stand, sitting here, we, we asked the big question about whether the court was going to stick with its newfound unanimity. That year, we were talking about the previous term being marked by an unusual degree of consensus on the Supreme Court, with over 65% of the decisions decided unanimously, the highest percentage since 1940. Well, I have the solemn duty to report to you uh, that uh, this year the unanimity uh, fell flat. Uh, and it, it, we saw instead a return of the sharp divisions that have marked the Roberts Court during its first decade. And this year we had 19 cases, um, many of them the biggest cases of the term, decided on a five to four split. These divisions were magnified by vigorous and passionate dissenting opinions that revealed how great the philosophical split is among the justices. If this term was a liberal term at the United States Supreme Court, it is for the exact same reason that the Roberts Court has traditionally been a conservative court, and his name is Anthony Kennedy. Justice Kennedy, the swing justice, has traditionally voted with the conservative block of the court in five to four decisions, that block being Chief Justice Roberts, Justices Antonin Scalia, Clarence Thomas, and Sam Alito, um, uh, in five to four cases, voting with that block 70% of the time, the court is split five to four. This term, however, Kennedy sided with the more liberal block on the court, um, uh, made up of Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, Stephen Breyer, and Elena Kagan. And, and Justice Kennedy voted with this block 65% uh, of the five to four splits. 
so no surprise that there were more liberal outcomes from the Supreme Court. And certainly as we prepare for a new Supreme Court term about to begin, the idea that the court has shifted to the left will certainly be tested. The court has on its docket major cases dealing with affirmative action, uh, voting rights, uh, most likely will take a case dealing with abortion rights, all areas where Justice Kennedy has often voted on the conservative side rather than the liberal side. Tonight, of course, we're here to focus on the, te the term that was just completed and to explore the lessons it offers uh, for us in understanding the Roberts Court and the overall direction of the Supreme Court and our constitutional law. Now, of course, by the nature of tonight's format, we can't cover all of the important cases uh, that were decided this term. For example, we probably won't have time uh, to discuss the landmark decision of Yates against United States. Now, the holding in Yates against United States might not have actually been all that significant. Uh, the court held that a provision of the federal Sarbanes-Oxley financial reform law did not apply to someone who destroyed illegally caught fish and wanted to hide it from investigation. But in Justice Kagan's dissenting opinion, she argued that fish should have been covered by the law. And for the first time in Supreme Court history, a Supreme Court justice cited and relied on that classic text of legal uh, acumen, quote, Dr. Seuss, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. But we're happy to talk about uh, Yates and any of the other important cases uh, of the term, even those that don't cite Dr. Seuss uh, in the question and answer period. I'm going to begin with a discussion of King versus Burwell, the Affordable Care Act case. Now, I always feel uh, a special pride talking about the Affordable Care Act cases in the Supreme Court when we are with uh, Professor Volokh. Uh, Professor Volokh's blog, The Volokh Conspiracy, has played a very influential role in shaping legal ideas and attitudes and litigation about and over the Affordable Care Act. In fact, if you're uh, interested, uh, there is a book that's been published um, called A Conspiracy Against Obamacare, The Vala Conspiracy and the Healthcare Case, which is available for purchase tonight uh, on Amazon.com. Um, you may recall that three years ago, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate, the requirement that everyone have or purchase health insurance. The Affordable Care Act was back before the Supreme Court this past term, and this time the question was whether the law authorized the federal government to offer tax credits to people who mostly lo low income, poor middle class people, uh, who buy insurance on the federally created insurance exchanges run by the Department of Health and Human Services. The law clearly allows the federal government to offer those credits on exchanges that are created and run by the states. Less clear, however, was whether those credits were allowable on the federally created exchanges. The Internal Revenue Service read the law to allow these tax credits even on the federally created exchanges. That prompted a lawsuit by the plaintiffs who argued that the credits were only permitted on state exchanges and not on the exchanges created by the federal government. With 34 states having refused to set up their own exchanges under the Affordable Care Act and the federal government stepping in and setting up those exchanges for them, uh, the outcome of this case would certainly impact millions of people who are purchasing or have purchased insurance on the federally created exchanges. And some warned, uh, depending on the outcome of the case, the very uh, Affordable Care Act itself could be fatally undermined. Unlike the first Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act a few years ago, King versus Burwell was not a constitutional case. It did not ask any questions dealing with constitutional law. It was a case of statutory interpretation. When, we, when you read the Affordable Care Act, does it allow for these subsidies or not? The challengers here said no. And they pointed to language in the statute that said that these credits would be available on, quote, an exchange established by the state, end quote. Now, the federal government is not a state, and therefore, by a straightforward reading of the statute, the challengers claimed, uh, federally created exchanges cannot offer these tax credits. Uh, 
The Obama administration countered that the law envisioned providing tax credits on the exchanges, even if they were created by the federal government. And they envisioned that the federal government would have to step in and create some of these exchanges if the states failed to do so. Indeed, the law requires the federal government to step in and create an exchange where the state has failed to do so. As uh, according to the language of the law, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services um, uh, is obligated to, quote, establish and operate such exchange within the state, end quote. Under this language, the administration argued, um, uh, the federal government is just effectively standing in the shoes of the state in creating this ex these exchanges. The administration also argued that um, even if the law is ambiguous, the court should defer to the IRS's interpretation uh, under uh, a doctrine known as Chevron deference, which is the idea that courts will generally de defer to administrative agencies when they're interpreting laws that they're charged with interpreting. By a vote of six to three, the Supreme Court ruled that the Affordable Care Act does permit tax credits on the federally created exchanges. And the majority opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts, who was joined by Justices Kennedy, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Justices Antonin Scalia, Clarence Thomas, and Sam Alito dissented. The justices were divided not just over the outcome of this case, but also over the very nature of the court's role when reviewing statutes. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Roberts admitted that the plaintiffs had a strong argument based on the language of the law, but nonetheless concluded that the government had the better case. While reading that one provision that says ex exchanges established by the state in isolation would certainly support the challenger's argument that their tax credits should not be available on federally created exchanges, the court insisted that that language of that provision must be read with, uh, within the, a larger context of the goals and purposes of the Affordable Care Act. As Roberts wrote, quote, a fair reading of legislation demands a fair understanding of the legislative plan. Here, the Affordable Care Act was designed to increase health care coverage and to create viable exchanges to serve as marketplaces for people who wanted to buy health insurance. And the tax credits, the majority said, were a key ingredient to, this, uh, to serving the law's objectives. The tax credits helped ensure that people forced to buy health insurance on the, uh, in one of these exchanges could actually afford to do so. Without credits, many people wouldn't be able to afford health insurance. They would fail to purchase health insurance unless or until uh, the moment when they became sick. And then under the law, they could purchase insurance and insurers could not discriminate against them because uh, under the law, one of the other provisions is that insurance companies cannot uh, discriminate on the basis of pre-existing uh, conditions. Denying credits, um, without these credits, many people wouldn't be able to afford insurance. Um, and uh, some suggested that if they can't buy the insurance and have to only buy insurance at the very last minute when they become sick, this would create what was known as a death spiral. Uh, not enough people would be financing uh, the health insurance companies. The health insurance companies wouldn't be able to afford uh, to just pay for all the catastrophic care that someone who signed up at the last minute wanted. Uh, and ultimately, the Affordable Care Act would crumble. Denying credits on the federally created exchanges would be, the Chief Justice said, quote, the type of calamitous result that Congress plainly meant to avoid. The majority rejected the challenger's argument that the lack of tax credits on the federally created exchanges was done on purpose by Congress as a way to encourage states to set up their own exchanges. The argument being that the states would know if they didn't set up their own exchanges, the federal government would set one up for them, but that their citizens, their residents, would not have access to these tax credits, making it harder for them to afford uh, to buy insurance. Now, this argument had one major drawback. Namely, that there was no evidence that any of the lawmakers understood the law to have this effect when they adopted it. In addition, the argument supposes that Congress purposefully included in the Affordable Care Act provisions that fatally undermined its core and stated goals. Congress, the Chief Justice wrote, 
quote, passed the Affordable Care Act to improve health insurance markets, not to destroy them. If at all possible, we must interpret the act in a way that is consistent with the former and avoids the latter. Justice Scalia wrote a strongly worded dissent. He said that the law was clear in only allowing credits on exchanges established by the states and accused the majority of bending the law in order to uphold the Affordable Care Act. The tone of Justice Scalia's dissents in this and other cases this term has drawn some renewed criticism by those who suggest that uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, dissents, laced as they are uh, with sarcasm on occasion and occasionally what seem to be personal attacks, were the wrong medicine for a legal profession that is struggling to enhance civility and that maybe students were getting the wrong lessons from Justice Scalia's dissents. But Scalia, perhaps unlikely to heed uh, such criticism as Supreme Court justices are wont to do, suggested in his dissent in King versus Burwell that the ACA should not be called Obamacare. But given the Supreme Court's wrong-headed decisions upholding it, he suggested, it should be called SCOTUS care. That didn't catch on, unfortunately. So it's still Obamacare to all of you who are looking for. Now, the King versus Burwell case is important not only for salvaging the tax credits, but also for what it tells us about the justices and how they approach questions of statutory interpretation. For years, Justice Scalia has advocated for what he calls a plain meaning approach to statutory interpretation. That is to say that, to say that courts should only look to the plain literal meaning of a statute and should not look at things like legislative history or should not try to figure out what was in the minds of lawmakers when they passed the law. What was in their minds was not what became law, rather what became law were the words on the page. Courts that stray from the plain literal meaning of the statute, Justice Scalia has argued, are in effect rewriting the law, engaging in inappropriate judicial activism and making the judiciary much more legislative than judicial. Now, Scalia's plain meaning approach to constitutional inter to statutory interpretation has been very influential, and some scholars have suggested that his influence on statutory interpretation, like his influence on uh, constitutional interpretation, will be one of the real defining features of Justice Scalia's legacy. Yet, it does remain clear that at least among a majority of justices on the Supreme Court, his plain meaning approach to constitutional interpretation has not taken hold. For a majority on the court today, it's clear that context matters, that they will look beyond the plain meaning of a statute to understand the general objectives and purposes of a statute and try to make the most sense of the law, even if the language of the law might be ambiguous. To these justices, it would have been activist to ignore the basic goals of the Affordable Care Act and to apply the law in a way that no one apparently had ever intended. King versus Burwell, therefore, is a victory uh, for theories of statutory interpretation that rely on general purposes uh, over approaches like Scalia's that emphasize plain meaning. King versus Bur Burwell was also a victory for the administration, but reflects a growing disenchantment among the justices for deferring to executive branch agencies. The court rejected the Obama administration's argument in this case that uh, if the law was ambiguous, uh, the court should defer to the IRS and its interpretation of the law to allow the tax credits on the federally created exchanges under that doctrine of Chevron deference. On the one hand, this loss for the administration was a significant victory for the administration. Because of how the case was decided, one potential future threat to the Affordable Care Act was taken off the table, namely the threat that might come from a new occupant in the White House. Under a Republican administration, the IRS could have reconsidered its earlier construction of the statute and possibly concluded that the tax credits were not available on the state, on the federally created exchanges. Yet the Supreme Court, by rejecting Chevron deference and interpreting the statute itself for, uh, for, the, for themselves, the justices, effectively said 
that uh, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act as it is, provides for these tax credits and that we will not defer to uh, the IRS's reading of the statute no matter what it is, whether it's for tax credits or against tax credits. So this provides an important protection for the Affordable Care Act's tax credits even against a new occupant in the White House. And that barring a complete repeal of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the next president will likely be, uh, 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 be obligated to provide these tax credits. The, the case also reminds us, though, that the court has increasingly been showing skepticism about Chevron deference and deference in general to administrative agencies. Just this past term, in a case called Michigan against EPA, the court held that the Environmental Protection Agency had unreasonably refused to consider costs uh, when determining how to regulate power plants under the Clean Air Act. And the court in that case declined to defer to the EPA. And in King versus Burwell, again, uh, the court admitted that the law was ambiguous, usually enough to trigger Chevron deference. But yet the court declined to defer here, suggesting that the decision was too important and too big for the IRS, which the majority noted, quote, has no expertise in crafting health insurance policy of this sort. Together, these two cases and similar rulings in recent years suggest that the court is not willing to defer to agencies uh, on certain very significant decisions of national policy. We may be entering a new era in judicial oversight of administrative agencies, one marked by much less deference than uh, under Chevron. Rolling back Chevron deference has been a major goal of some in the legal community, especially many people uh, on the conservative side of the legal spectrum who believe the administrative state has grown too large. If King ver versus Burwell speeds up this process of limiting Chevron deference, then this is one decision that is today celebrated by liberals, but that might tomorrow be celebrated by conservatives. Thank you. So I want to thank Cindy first for all of her support for this great program to keep it going and uh, Adam for, for coordinating us here. Um, I'm really sick about talking about Kim Davis, so I'm not going to talk about Kentucky clerks denying marriage licenses. Um, and I'm sure we'll have time in Q&A and we can talk about religious liberty and I'm actually learning from Eugene's writing on this um, and the RIF claims there. Um, so they might be better directed towards others anyway. Um, so you can read as much as, as uh, you could imagine on the religious liberty questions that are popping up right now. So rather than focus on that, I'm gonna focus on Obergefell versus Hodges from a family law perspective. Um, and instead, uh, try to figure out how we got to this place where the court validates same-sex marriage and what the future conflicts might be around uh, questions of LGBT family formation. So Obergefell is primarily a substantive due process holding. Same-sex couples have a fundamental right to marry, the court held, but the decision also included equality reasoning. Withholding marriage from same-sex couples violates equal protection. And the two principles, liberty and equality, are related. Justice Kennedy described them as, quote, connected in a profound way, which I want to suggest may be critical to LGBT rights in the family going forward. So let's step back and look at contestation over the meaning of marriage and its relationship to families formed by same-sex couples. We see in claims to marriage equality both what I'm going to call an adult-centered and a child-centered view of marriage. The adult-centered model of marriage and its application to same-sex couples was constructed in part through claims to non-marital recognition in the 1980s and 90s. Shut out of marriage, same-sex couples saw a status that afforded some rights to their relationships. Using marriage to justify and explain domestic partnership, LGBT advocates stressed adult romantic affiliation, mutual emotional support, and economic interdependence. And these efforts shaped advocates' eventual claims to marriage that stressed many of the attributes we saw in domestic partnership. This adult-centered view responded to the arguments of their opponents who attempted to link marriage to procreation and child rearing. But parenting claims were emerging at the same time. The lesbian baby boom beginning in the 1980s saw many lesbian couples have children through assisted reproductive technology, namely donor insemination. 
And eventually some courts began to analogize non-marital lesbian family formation to donor insemination by married different sex couples. So unmarried lesbian co-parents were like married heterosexual husbands who consented to their wife's insemination. They were the parents of the resulting children with all of the rights and obligations. So when LGBT advocates turned to claims to marriage, they leveraged these parent-child relationships now recognized outside marriage to advance a child-centered model of marriage that could include same-sex couples, one based on social non-biological parenting. And this too responded to arguments of their opponents who now linked a more specific brand of procreation and child rearing to marriage, emphasizing sexual or natural reproduction and biological gender differentiated parenting. Both the adult and child centered models of marriage were produced in conflict, not merely over same sex marriage, but over the rights of same sex couples more generally. The arguments pressed by LGBT advocates for years found voice in Obergefell where we see both adult and child-centered views of marriage justifying marriage equality. So beginning with a more adult-centered view, Justice Kennedy explained that, quote, the right to marry is fundamental because it supports a two-person union unlike any other in its importance to the committed individuals. Marriage, Kennedy continues, offers the hope of companionship and understanding and assurance that while both still live, there will be someone to care for the other. Marriage through this lens is about adult partnership, and emotional and economic interdependence. But Kennedy soon pivoted to marriage's child-centered dimensions. Another reason, quote, for protecting the right to marry, he explained, is that it safeguards children and families and thus draws meaning from related rights of child rearing, procreation, and education. Marriage here is linked to reproduction and parenting. Kennedy situated same-sex couple-headed families within this child-centered view of marriage. In doing so, he made the distinction between biological and non-biological relationships immaterial, explaining, quote, many same-sex couples provide loving and nurturing homes to their children, whether biological or adopted. Citing the amicus brief submitted by the Williams Institute's Adam Romero on behalf of the Williams Institute's Gary Gates, Justice Kennedy noted that, quote, hundreds of thousands of children are presently being raised by same-sex couples. Ultimately, with respect to the reasons why marriage is fundamental, including both the adult and child-centered dimensions, the court concluded, quote, there is no difference between same and opposite sex couples. So to understand what the court rejected, consider the views expressed by the dissenting justices. Chief Justice Roberts elaborated a child-centered view of marriage, what he termed the traditional biologically rooted view that centers sexual reproduction and biological mother-father parenting a view incompatible with same-sex family formation. Marriage, Roberts reasons, ensures, quote, that children are conceived by a mother and father committed to raising them in the stable conditions of a lifelong relationship. Justice Alito's dissent even more sharply distinguished between adult and child-centered views of marriage. But in characterizing the court as adopting the adult-centered view, the dissent elided the child-centered dimensions of the court's decision. Reiterating the distinction he drew in his Windsor dissent two years earlier, Justice Alito distinguished between what he termed a consent-based view of marriage and a conjugal view of marriage. The consent-based view, he wrote in Windsor, quote, primarily defines marriage as the solemnization of mutual commitment marked by strong emotional attachment and sexual attraction between two persons. This, what he characterizes as what same-sex couples are seeking, sounds strikingly like domestic partnership the adult-centered model constructed by same-sex couples in the space outside marriage. In contrast, the conjugal or traditional view, quote, sees marriage as an exclusively opposite-sex institution inextricably linked to procreation and biological kinship. This, of course, is the view pushed by same-sex marriage opponents. In Obergefell, Justice Alito reiterated this distinction that he drew in Windsor. Under the traditional view in which, quote, marriage is inextricably linked to the one thing that only an opposite sex couple can do, procreate, states formalize and promote marriage in order to encourage potentially procreative conduct to take place within a lasting unit that has long been thought to provide the best atmosphere for raising children, close quote. Note that for the dissenters, the emphasis is on sexual or what some of them term natural procreation and what follows from that, biological, gender differentiated parenting. Yet in characterizing same-sex couples as seeking simply the consent-based view of marriage and the court as embracing merely that view, Justice Alito missed the extent to which the majority adopted not only an adult-centered view of marriage, but also a refashioned, LGBT-inclusive, child-centered view of marriage. 
This view does not draw a distinction between natural and assisted reproduction, biological and non-biological parents, or mothers and fathers. Instead, the majority's child-centered view of marriage centers parenthood that depends neither on biology nor gender. This model of parenthood, central to same-sex marriage, is the one that advocates pressed in earlier work on behalf of unmarried same-sex parents. Even as the court's acceptance of marriage equality relied on and extended modes of family life built by same-sex couples outside marriage, its reasoning, echoing Windsor, shored up the privileged status of marriage. So as someone myself who's unmarried, I apparently failed to realize how lonely I was before reading Justice Kennedy's words. Quote, <laughs> Marriage responds to the universal fear that a lonely person might call, call out only to find no one there, close quote. <laughs> Lesbians and gay men seek, according to Kennedy, quote, not to be condemned to live in loneliness. For Justice Kennedy, marriage's specialness transcends these individual urges. In fact, it's, quote, a keystone of our social order. Importantly, Kennedy includes children in this ode to marriage, drawing a sharp line between marital and non-marital parenting. Quote, without the recognition, stability, and predictability that marriage offers, same-sex couples' children suffer the stigma of knowing that their families are somehow lesser. They also suffer the material costs of being raised by unmarried parents, relegated through no fault of their own to a more difficult and uncertain family life. Indeed, it's the dissenters who seem to recognize the way in which marriage no longer organizes family life for vast numbers of Americans. Justice Alito noted that, quote, the tie between marriage and procreation has frayed, and he drew attention to the increasing rates of non-marital birth. Nonetheless, from a normative perspective, Justice Kennedy and the dissenters share in common this privileging of marriage, even if they have in mind very different understandings. This should give us pause moving forward, as the vulnerabilities experienced by those with children may have less to do with sexual orientation discrimination and more to do with marital status discrimination. And this result is ironic, given that the understanding of family embedded in the court's acceptance of same-sex marriage traces its roots to the recognition of same-sex uh, couple-headed families living outside marriage. Thankfully, as I'll suggest in a moment, there are signs that even the court's marriage-centric reasoning may give way to principles of liberty and equality that come to shape parent-child relationships outside marriage. The model of parenthood at stake in the court's recognition of same-sex marriage challenges conventional views of reproduction and parenting, valuing social rather than biological ties, and focusing on parents generally rather than mothers and fathers. And this model of parenthood, I want to suggest, is critical to the future of LGBT rights struggles and to family law more generally. So consider the marital presumption. A child born to a married woman is deemed a child of the marriage, and her husband is presumed to be the child's biological and thus legal parent. For a married lesbian couple, though, the non-biological mother is the legal parent because she intends to raise the child with her spouse. Some states are resisting applying the marital presumption to same-sex couples, reasoning that it shouldn't apply to a same-sex spouse who we know is not the biological parent. For example, Iowa used the marital presumption as the basis for refusing to list both women who were married on the birth certificate of the child they had through anonymous donor insemination. Ruling in favor of the same-sex couple, the Iowa Supreme Court extended the logic on which it justified marriage equality years earlier to parenting. The differential treatment of different sex and same-sex couples was based on what the court described as, quote, stereotype or prejudice. In other words, continued resistance to family forms that depart from traditional patterns rooted in biology and gender, patterns clearly disrupted by same-sex parents. Since Obergefell, similar disputes have popped up in other states, and there's litigation pending in Arkansas and Utah. Challenges to the marital presumption's application to lesbian couples represents continuing resistance to sexual orientation equality, but it, it also represents attempts to recenter biology and gender in parentage in ways that bear on the parentage regime more broadly. And the implications of this model of parenthood aren't limited to marital reproduction and parenting. As states accommodate the use of ART by different sex couples, the constitutional principles on which same-sex marriage is premised may compel those states to include same-sex couples on equal terms. Critically, they, this may occur for non-marital families despite the marriage-centric language of Windsor and Obergefell. A decision from Florida provides an example. Florida had increasingly recognized unmarried, non-biological, heterosexual parents. Its family code makes an unmarried, quote, commissioning couple using ART the legal parents of the resu resulting child, but defines commissioning couple as the intended mother and father, gendered terms. 
In 2013, the Florida Supreme Court considered whether unmarried commissioning couples could be limited in this way, and the court cited Windsor before concluding that, quote, the state doesn't have a legitimate interest in precluding same-sex couples from being given the same opportunity as heterosexual couples to demonstrate parental intent. Marriage equality provided a constitutional precedent for a case involving unmarried same-sex parents. And more generally, marriage equality validates same-sex family formation in ways that may mainstream different forms of ART and non-biological parenthood for all families. Consider debates over surrogacy. Gay male couples have increasingly turned to surrogacy to have children, yet in many states, surrogacy is legally restricted in ways that inhibit gay fathers' parental recognition. If the prevailing view of same-sex marriage is adult-centered and neatly separates marriage from procreation, as Justice Alito suggests, then marriage equality may do little to impede efforts to restrict family formation through ART. But if same-sex marriage is also child-centered, signifying family-based equality for same-sex couples and validating a less biological and less gendered model of parenthood, then marriage equality casts serious constitutional doubt on attempts to restrict parenthood through ART and to privilege biology. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I want to situate uh, my comments about the Supreme Court's race jurisprudence um, in what I see as a larger debate that's captured between the majority and minority. This is actually one area where I do think Adam's characterization of a sort of fault line is actually quite accurate. Um, and it basically regards the meaning of equality, particularly as it pertains to race. Um, so what is it that constitutes discriminatory conduct that is actionable either under the Constitution, under the 14th Amendment, or under the federal anti-discrimination statutes which apply to employment, housing, and voting. Basically, we could think about discrimination as a relatively simple model in which we look for a perpetrator who is motivated by bad intent that affects the outcome with respect to a particular individual. We could also think of it in the way that social psychologists have encouraged us to think about it, which is it's about a system of relations between people and groups of people. It's about systems. It's about the ways in which things are structured. Um, and so that forms and practices of subordination cannot be so easily captured. Uh, in this other model, we might think about questions of exclusion and marginality and the ways in which mechanisms enforce that as being enforced through both de jure, that is under law, specific and intentional kinds of discrimination, uh, as well as de facto, uh, that is race neutral, um, or if you will, um, disparate impact kinds of discrimination. And that debate, whether or not that latter category of uh, discrimination counts in terms of federal constitutional law and in terms of Con, uh, in terms of statutory law is really at the heart of a lot of the disputes here. <clears throat> the majority, that is Roberts and three others, uh, Scalia, Alito, and Thomas, and sometimes Kennedy, uh, have embraced the notion that equality largely means treating race as irrelevant, except in extraordinary circumstances. And doctrinally, this has been expressed as applying strict scrutiny review, that is the most heightened form of constitutional review, not only to policies that intentionally discriminate and inflict racial harm, but also to those policies that attempt to take race into account to remedy those harms. Uh, certainly, the Roberts course did, did not introduce this line of thinking, but it has been a very powerful advocate, that is the majority, for this colorblind point of view, that is applying both strict scrutiny to both the harm and the policies and the regulations designed to remedy the harm. Uh, four of the justices, Ginsburg, uh, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Breyer, have largely rejected that view, and as I said, Kennedy has moved back and forth. Um, now, there have been many critiques of colorblindness, including ones that I have tried to author, um, <clears throat> uh, but one of them has to do with the problem of collapsing the distinction of what I call between ought and is. Uh, one might make a normative argument that race ought not to be relevant. The question is, however, from a constitutional standpoint, is whether it is. Um, and certainly one might think about the continued ways in which race remains salient. We have um, in, in our current uh, political discourse a focus on anti-black racial violence, public and private, 
uh, the ways in which the carceral state, jails, detention, systems of monitoring, actually target on the basis of race. And this stands in contradiction to what might be a set of normative commitments about what ought to be, but here we have it. Uh, we also have uh, questions about the relationship between wealth um, and race, uh, wealth inequality, and the racial dimension of it and its relationship to housing is actually at the heart of one of the cases that I want to talk about tonight. Um, and there's also this question of political power. Uh, does the election of President Obama, uh, which had actually been explicitly invoked in a number of the voting rights cases, I'm going to try to, to get to one of the voting rights cases tonight, um, but the election of President Obama has been explicitly invoked uh, as evidence that we need no longer pay attention to race in the voting context. Uh, these dilemmas, I think, are, or I, I should say, discussions, controversies, are very much at the heart of what is animating the court's conversation. So I first want to turn, as I mentioned, to uh, the case, the housing case. And this is Texas Department of Housing versus Inclusive Communities Project. Um, it has to do with the interpretation of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, um, in which Congress's stated goal was to eliminate uh, or eradicate racial segregation. Um, some 60 years out, uh, what we know is that actually America remains highly segregated residentially by race. And part of this has to do with the legacy of a very long history of legal exclusion by race in, term, in terms of access to property and particularly to home ownership. So we have, of course, the history of restrictive covenants. Uh, actually, the house that I own has one on the deed. I found that out when I, I looked at it. It um, was uh, enacted in 1924, and it banned the sale of the house to any blacks or Asians. Um, the federal housing policy actually enforced segregation, um, and it did so. So think about um, prior to the federal government's intervention into the mortgage market, it was actually pretty hard to get a mortgage. You had to put down a lot of money, and you had to pay it off pretty quickly. Uh, the FHA federal guarantee changed all of that, and basically it changed the mortgage market by <clears throat> allowing um, for private developers to go, or the private financing market, to rely on the government as a backstop. Um, and what that did, the federal government, in order to decide which areas it would, in fact, back mortgages in, it created a map of the United States and of all the areas, and it graded them. It gave a ranking system. It put an A on areas that were predominantly white and were considered to be credit worthy. And it put a D on areas where blacks resided, uh, which it continued to, uh, which it marked in red, hence the term redlining, uh, as not credit worthy. And so you basically had suburbanization and the development of a lot of post World War II housing um, being driven by a financing market that was explicitly color coded. You also had the federal government's involvement in the siting of low, low income and public housing. Um, and this also was done in ways that reinforced segregation. Um, Chicago, my hometown, originally 98% of the public housing in that city was located into already economically stressed black neighborhoods and produced some of the more iconic and dystopic visions of public housing in part because of those decisions. So we have as a consequence of federal housing policy and the ways of the operation of the private market a way in which uh, some have said that white flight has actually been socially engineered. We often think about the decision about where we buy a house as one in which we sort of make up our own minds. We, you know, we go online, we look at Trulia, you know, we make a decision. However, as it turns out, our, our decisions are often shaped by larger structural forces that have to do with the fact that the way in which the market was racially marked <coughs> tied housing value to segregation. And so even a well-meaning uh, person, a white person who did not hold animus towards their black neighbor, uh, might say something like, every time I look at my black neighbor, I see my housing values drop by two or $3,000. That's a quote from an earlier um, interview that was done in the uh, 60s, I believe. <clears throat> so what then becomes a rational individual choice? A rational individual choice against this background can be to actually reinforce segregation. The specific question at issue in the case at hand, though, had to do with the uh, state policy and the way in which it was handing out um, tax credits. So 
tax credits were, it's interesting, so we tax credits with uh, uh, the ACA, tax credits with housing. Turns out taxes have a lot to do with development, have a lot to do with the way in which the economy structures and provides certain services. In this particular case, the federal housing tax credits get disseminated by the state. And the issue uh, at hand was that the um, inclusive housing uh, organization alleged that the agency's decisions about where it was um, dispersing these low-income housing credits was actually reinforcing segregation. So the, uh, the organization had done some analysis to look at the percentage of low-income tax credits that were allocated to communities that were predominantly white versus the allocation to communities that were predominantly black, and it saw what, it's, what it believed to be a fairly stark pattern of disparity. Um, once the plaintiff had established this pattern, it, uh, it argued that it, would, it should be up to the agency uh, to show that it had a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for making these decisions. Now, in this regard, this pattern that I've just described is the classic sort of disparate impact proof pattern that has been part of Title VII employment discrimination law for uh, a long time since a decision called Griggs versus Duke Power. Uh, and in Griggs, uh, what happened was that a company that had a longstanding practice of racial discrimination in its hiring and promotional practices um, actually um, on the, uh, immediately following the enactment of Title VII, decided that it wanted to impose a requirement that all of its applicants for particular positions had to have a high school diploma. And that requirement actually had a extraordinarily racially disparate impact. What was interesting as well is that of course there were whites that did not have a high school diploma that were already performing the job who were not subjected to that requirement. The court in Griggs set up the disparate impact framework and said, um, discrimination can occur through race-neutral measures that are otherwise unjustified if they have a disproportionate impact on a protected group. So what we have here is the effort to ask the question whether or not the statutory language of the Federal Housing Act also permits this kind of disparate impact claim. Um, basically, the answer that the court gave in, um, in its decision was yes. Um, disparate impact is permitted as an analysis under the FHA, and primarily it relied on the fact that, one, the language in the act looked very similar to the language in a prior case um, the, uh, where the court had dealt with the question of whether or not disparate impact was permitted under the Age Discrimination Act. Um, the other thing it said was that <clears throat> it was clear that Congress had intended for disparate impact to remain a part of the structure because in 1988, um, at the time when some amendments came up before Congress, the district uh, or the courts of appeals interpreting the Federal Housing Act had permitted disparate impact claims. Congress was aware of that. The, the lower courts, I should say the appellate courts, were unanimous in their view that disparate impact was permitted. And so the fact that Congress did not move to correct that demonstrated that Congress was um, in, in accord with the way that the courts were interpreting uh, the act. So for four decades, unanimous across the circuits, uh, the courts have affirmed the use of disparate impact and the majority um, said in this opinion that had a lot of weight. It also actually interestingly cited HUD, the housing um, department that is charged with enforcing the uh, FHA, and said that the agency had also issued rulings and regulations that reflected the disparate impact was in fact um, permitted. So the question is, why is this even a question? If for 40 years this has been settled law, uh, if, if in fact um, <clears throat> the Congress has known about this for a long time, has done nothing, um, if we can point to all of this, why is this even a question? Well, partly it goes back to the point that I made at the beginning. Um, one of the things that disparate impact requires is that you pay attention to race. That is, in order to measure whether or not there's a disparity, you actually have to take account of race. For the majority, this taking account of race, this act of actually paying attention to race, is itself risky and raises a potential racial injury to whites. Uh, and this was actually the argument that was advanced in a case in a prior, um, several years ago, called Ricci, which you all may recall involving the New Haven firefighters. 
uh, that was a case in which the city defended its actions, canceling the results of a uh, test that had been given because of its racially disparate impact. The court in that case uh, ruled in favor of Ricci uh, and significantly um, tried to, uh, I guess I would say, mediate what it saw as a tension between disparate treatment, that is intentional discrimination, and disparate impact. Without going into all of Ricci now, I guess I would say what's interesting about the Texas case is that we have the court affirming disparate impact after Ricci because many people thought that a disparate impact was pretty much on its deathbed uh, after Ricci itself. Um, Justice uh, Scalia wrote a fairly scathing, typical, uh, <laughs> a, a dissent in which he actually argued that disparate impact was itself an unconstitutional uh, framework. So what you have is you see sort of the application of strict scrutiny, not just to the question of the government um, using race in, in ways to harm, but you also here again see the application of strict scrutiny to the remedy itself. That is, does the remedy itself uh, produce a racial harm? I think that um, I'm aware that I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm not going to talk about the voting rights case uh, directly, other than to say both of these cases represent a fascinating question regarding how forms of subordination can shift over time. So we can think about segregation as a problem involving exclusion on the basis of race, but we can also think about the question of what are the policies and actions that reinforce patterns of segregation? Does packing um, more low-income housing um, that is likely to be occupied minorities into areas that already have significant numbers of uh, low-income housing. Does that constitute reinforcement of segregation? Does that constitute sort of just recognizing community? Does that constitute sort of wise housing policy in the sense of putting more of your money where you're going to get more bang for your buck? These are some of the questions that uh, came up in the dissent, but I, I hope to be able to talk a little bit more about its relationship to the voting rights case um, when in the Q&A. Thank you.